Um, now we can't talk about car trouble because this is being recorded. But let's go ahead and move on. Um, somebody has to say they got it, and it's, oh, it's this one, silly me. Do, 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 do. And this one here, I'm going to stop. If I stop that video, I'm hoping that you all can see it. Ritz, if you cannot see video, let me know. But I stopped the video camera on me just because I'm self-conscious. And so it's my fault. But today we are working on negotiating the offers. So really quickly, there's two things that we always negotiate. What are those things that we negotiate in, in every contract? Price and terms. So does anybody not understand price? Because that's, that's the easy one. And if you think about it, no, from, from a seller perspective or from a buyer perspective, isn't that the one you think of most? It's always about the price, but is it? Who here owns their home? Owns a, a couple of homeowners. Who wants, to be my, who wants to be my guinea pig? Okay, Leo, you're it. Leo, tell me a little bit about your place. New construction, three bedroom house, um, ballpark within a hundred thousand. What did you pay for it? Wow. Say four hundred ish. Okay, so if I offered you two million dollars for your house, would you take it? You want to do it, but it would be two hundred cash. Could you do that? You don't want two hundred dollars. Two hundred. I'm sorry, two million cash. You wouldn't take it. Oh, oh, yeah, you take it. Great. We will close in 20 years. Why are you laughing? So is that a good deal or not now? Why not? We'll be under contract for 20 years. Could anything happen to me or you or our, our situations in 20 years? So it is. It's about price and terms. We agreed upon a price, the term may not work. Does that kind of, does that this is a super easy example? But I wanted just to put that perspective in your minds because yeah, it's always about price, but you've got to make sure the terms meet too. Because walk me through now. Did any of you hear stories about crazy deals that were going on in the last three to five years? Just give me an example of one of those crazy deals, Lucas. Okay, so your dad had to put $40,000 of earnest money down. Tell me about that earnest money. What were the terms on that? Oh, so it was non-refundable earnest money in addition to. Now, was that crazy? That is crazy town to get it. And did dad discover anything? Did he get the house? Okay, so it's a new build. Did he discover anything that he kind of wishes he knew since that time? No, so he's... Okay. So he, he had a pretty good idea of what he was getting. Okay. Can you imagine, though, some... I've seen people walk in. Again, this is... We're going back three years. We're not in three years ago time. So this is nice. We're in a more normal time frame and more normal sales process that we're in. And so I love that. Um, I don't like, I like the higher prices that helps us, but it, it also helps our sellers, right? But if you're a brand, if you're a first time home buyer, is that painful? The higher prices is hard. Interest rates, those are starting to hurt feelings too. And so that's kind of our double whammy now where three years ago, it was, if you hear about a house that might be coming on, you want to be one of the first ones in, lock that baby down just so that you can move forward. Let's pretend, I'm picking on your dad's situation, Lucas, just because we have a buyer who's under contract. They put down $40,000 of earnest money, and now they've discovered they may not want that house. How can they protect themselves, or what can they do? What's one, just one idea. Say again. 
like it's something that wasn't disclosed before he put on it. Okay, they could try and find something that wasn't disclosed and they could possibly sue. I want to, I just want to expand your mind to your thinking again. What if you sold your interest in a contract to somebody else? So dad gets his money back because someone else is going to buy that house, you know, buy the contract from your dad. And then he would at least not lose his money. So what I'm saying is, as we negotiate, you know, those are some things. Have, has anybody been in negotiations before? Have you negotiated for something? You bought When you bought your houses, let's take it away from a real estate experience. Did you buy a car before? Okay. What was that like? Brimley, tell me. What, what was it like? It was a while ago. Was it really fun? So there's excitement. Okay, so you had a mentor. Did she? I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you, but yeah. So it's a used vehicle like you were buying. And so there's some damage that you're negotiating. And I'm saying that again for the benefit of those online. Okay. So one key, that's that's kind of hard. So that means I have to go and re-key or get a get a copy. Um, unless it's electronic keys, those get fun. Okay. <laughs> Before you got the key remade, you lost your key. Yeah. A day in the life. But tell me about the negotiations. Walk me through some of that. I, I kind of hear more about that than, than your life story because the life story is interesting, but it won't help our class. And so I'm teasing you. Okay. Yeah. No, I walked through the door and um, got to look at it and I had been, um, my mom asked, taught me how to understand the way it worked properly. Everything worked properly, but it was just the energy itself. Um, they told us they were like price that they were asking for it was uh -huh. seven or eight thousand. Okay. This must have been a long time ago. It was only seven or eight thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you paid seven thousand for it because you get to pay taxes, and there's probably some kind of other fees that they tack on, which is where they make, really make their money. Yeah. Okay, but an exciting experience. Who's had a negative negotiating experience? Because when you hear negotiations, is it a negative thing? Scarlett, tell me about your experience. <laughs> okay, we're not even going there. Um, and, and do we want to go through the terms that we were negotiating? <laughs> I was lying to you. Oh, okay. That's a challenge. When you say terms, can you list some of the terms? Of course. Well, so we'll get into some real estate terms in a second. I promise we'll go there. Have you had negative? I walked into this negotiating, negotiating thing. Uh, yes. And for some reason, I can't make this work. So. Nobody can. That's, that's, the yeah. that's because I'm on the wrong keyboard. Do, 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 do. Okay. So make sure. Okay. So we'll go through that and we'll talk about some terms specifically that, that we're discussing um, in real estate. But who has some ideas? What are some terms? I, we did one, obviously, was possession, right? Mm -hmm. Possession is something we, that's in section three, I believe, of the REPSI. 
right, is we negotiate possession. When, when does the buyer take possession of the property? Sure. That's that's a contract between me and my buyer um, is my fiduciary duties. So it's going to be loyalty, obedience, full disclosure, um, confidentiality, and anything else the law requires. Right. That's that's a WTC class. We'll talk about that. Um, but those things are fun. And if this is right in your look, this is in your buyer broker or your do, uh, or your exclusive right to sell agreement. That's right under agency. And so you can't you won't miss that. So those are certainly terms, but those are not negotiable terms. Those are actually part of the contract. They're, they're not negotiable. You shall maintain fiduciary for your client. You will not violate that. Closing costs, that's absolutely something we negotiate. Um, I have to have this easel and this paper because it is so awesome and I can doodle all I, I need this when I buy this house. Is it negotiable? Sure. It's, say again. Yeah, because it's personal property. We would, we, you could put it as part one of the Repsy as well. One dot one, I think it is. We, is that what it is? Where is it? It's page one. It, it's, it's one. One dot one. So it could be personal. So personal property. I have to have that PC. Well, no, that was my grandpa's PC, and you know, when I given that one up, that was an old original Apple iMac, with the. 640k drive you know the floppy drive in it but if that was something grandpa used that may be something of emotional value you know to somebody so those are terms so there's so there's personal property we talked about closing costs what else and possession yeah how about your my financing date um are, are all of our deadline dates in section 24 those things are kind of important um, what about Dean and Lori? Are, we're buying a place. We're building. We're supposed to go to four way sometime this week or next week. Don't know for sure what day. Do you know what four way is? Four way in new construction. When you go walk through the house, that means it's framed. And so you have the framing, the electrical, the plumbing, and the HVAC the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system in the house. We have to look at all the, all the plumbing stuff is in the house. So I'm walking through, this is before they put the, the sheetrock up. So you do a four-way walkthrough and say, yep, that's where I wanted it. And I'll give you a dumb example. And I negotiated specifically in the house that I live in now because we built it. I said, I have to have the shower head start at seven feet high. It has to start at a seven foot point because by the time they put in the the shower floor or a tub, depending on where you are, that shower head's right here for me, and it's not very fun. So I did that for for me. Um, I'm going to pick on Jenna. That may not be an issue. Just just say it, Jenna. It might not be an issue for you, but for me, it's an issue, and it was something I cared about. In fact, as I was walking, a friend of mine, um, some of you have met him um, for Stuart Title is um, Kenneth Roberts. Kenneth is six seven or six eight. And so he's taller than I am. I look up to Kenneth a lot. But can you imagine if he bought that house and it had a six foot shower? And then by the time he puts the floor in there, it's about, now it's about five eight where that shower head comes out. And then it bends down. And if you have those big shower heads, right? You've seen those. All of a sudden, that thing here, it's hit, hit him in the chest. And I'm sorry, folks on the mic. Um, does that kind of make sense? Anyway, those are just, they're little things, but that's a four way. And so we negotiate those kinds of things. So I negotiated to have higher shower heads. They didn't put it in correct. I said, no, this needs to be at seven feet because I can reach just about eight feet. I think fingertips and on my toes, I can touch eight feet, but not quite if I flat footed on, without shoes. You know, so if I wear my elevator shoes, I'll be fine. But does that make sense? But I want a seven foot shower head because it means that much to me. Anyway, little things, but walk through it and say, no, there's a fix. We need to get that fixed before, but isn't it better to do it at the four way than they've already put up the sheetrock, they put up the tile and everything else, and now they've got to break it and move and add this much pipe to put my shower head up to where I need it. So, so little things. Have, 
when they were coming. <clears throat> yeah, but we that's why you do it at the four way because they can add that pipe right now. There's no walls, there's nothing. No, no, if, if I waited until it was tiled, then it would be a problem. Yeah, so, and then it becomes more, that becomes more of a headache. And I say, look, not my problem. We talked about it at four way as well as on my contract. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll try and offer you money, say, look, we'll, we'll knock 500 bucks off the price of your house. And I'll say, yeah, that's 500 bucks, but I have to keep hitting my nose on the shower head every time. I don't want to do that. I'm not that tall, but I'm tall enough that it makes a difference. What's that? I am, I used to be 6'2". I may have shrunk a hair. Okay, so we're, we talked a little bit about what is negotiation. We'll talk about the three Ps. We'll do some recaps and ahas throughout, and then some tips for negotiation. So let's move on. What do you think about that? Now, most people don't even know who Lee Steinberg is. You have to yeah. Yeah, you negotiate with your children. But negotiate is not something to be avoided or feared. It's an everyday part of life. And I'm going to grab a chair and join you guys. Is that okay? But I love negotiations. Now, Again, what are some what are some myths about negotiation for, that you get from this? That negotiation's somehow bad because it's not; it's great. Um, because what what is the intent of negotiation? To get yeah, to get what you want, and isn't that what we want to do with our clients? Working with our clients, we want to negotiate with them. Um, there's a negotiate. In fact, I know that in your MLS, when you log in, there'll be a, some kind of a blurb talking about this negotiation class coming up for the MLS. There's just sometimes they'll, I just saw it when, when I logged in this morning and it said, or it was in my email, it was one or the other, <clears throat> but it said, you can get your negotiation, um, designation, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, you can get what's called a CNA, a certified negotiation expert. And there are, you'll notice you're, when you get some agents' cards, they have an alphabet of stuff behind their names. I, I have to tell people, yeah, I'm Dean Crandall. I am a, a PB for principal broker. I'm an MPA for master of public administration. I have a BS degree in psychology. That's what I'll go there. Um, and I have my DOPE. And anyway. Yeah. Just because I'm a dope, but you know, but because I think it's silly to put all this, but that's me. I just think you don't care if I'm a PhD or if I'm an MPA or anything else. All you care is that I'm going to do something for you. I can put a CNE behind my name as well, and I can put, oh my goodness, there's a, another one for short sell SFR, short sell financial resource. Or, it just doesn't matter. Take classes to learn something, not so that you can add acronyms behind your, your name. Just say it. Because I think what we do here is what, way more valuable than what you'll get in, in something else. But negotiation is something to look forward to. So we'll talk a little bit about two kinds of negotiations today. There's going to be negotiation between you and the other agent as you're representing your client. And then there's going to be negotiation between you and your client. Because is there an outside chance, Jenna, that you could have a crazy client? <laughs> okay, that's a that, great answer. Because that was right. Jenna laughed because she had, uh, I believe, didn't they want at least 30 or 40% off on the house they were buying? Yeah. And it's awesome. And say, guess what? If I found that, I'd probably buy it for myself because that's my next investment property. I, my, I have investment properties. I want to buy another one. And and if I can find something at 40% off, dude, I got it. I want it. That's why people that invest get into real estate because they can get a hold of those deals faster. I'm not saying that you should compete against your clients, but if you're helping your client find something and you find something, you should help them get it. But if you're out looking for yourself and you find something, buy it. Um, stealing from Gary Keller, the, he says, there is no wrong time to buy the right property or it's always the right time by the right property. Even right now when it's really hard, the right time would be if you have cash for sure to buy that property. But if you don't, find some interesting or I'll say um, innovative ways, out of the box thinking to, to finance that guy. Okay, so 
negotiation is simply negotiating. But here, have we have you guys heard about the white four C two Ts? You know what this is? Oh my goodness. Who has who's not familiar with the Y4 C2 TES? Okay, that's shame on us. It takes the first letter of each of these guys here. Y4 C2 TES. Okay, win, win, or no deal. This is every organization has what I and you can dang Google it, you'll get a better copy of it than photocopying it here or shooting a picture here. But I, I want you guys to understand this is who we are. This is what we are as a company. Because every company has a belief system. This just happens to be ours. Win, win, or no deal. We shouldn't do a deal if it's a win, lose. But what about the couple that's losing their house and it's going to be, you know, they're, you're going to buy the house as a short sale. What's the win for the seller in that, so that scenario? Say again. A short sale means that the, okay, really quick, what's a short sale? Oh, this is a term that you may start to hear when the market turns and it could turn i'm not saying it will but we may see a really down market short sales were almost the rule of the game in 2009 2010 short not meaning stature but meaning how much of what was owed was the value of the home so the value of the home was short of a full payoff and so the bank was willing to take less than what they were owed or short of a full payoff so that's why they call it a short sale you bought a short sale so you yeah. yeah. It was fast. That means they were probably well down the path of negotiating with the bank. That's why it was fast. It's not because it's never fast, unless it's an awesome, awesome purchase. But win, win, or no deal. What's the win for a seller in a short sale? They didn't have to get a foreclosure on their record. They may or may not have to declare BK, but think about it. On a credit application, would you like what is the first question on every credit app? Have you ever had a foreclosure or have you declared BK in the last three to five years? Bankruptcy, sorry, BK. Um, but have you ever had a foreclosure? Bummer if you have a foreclosure because you can never, ever take that off your record. That sits there. It just means you may not ever get your credit score up. You know, so it actually, over, in short term, I promise you they have terrible credit because they're at least six months behind on their payments right sure. yeah for someone that's going through a short so we have whole classes we can do on that we're not going that's not the nature of this one i would say don't do short sales as a listing agent because you don't have the time to negotiate those because you're calling the bank you'll be on hold for an hour and you'll say hey i'm calling about this particular one oh they we sold that loan sorry and you go wait I, but 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 you sure and that's where it's really hard. Or they'll say, oh yeah, we, we have an incomplete file. Well, can you tell me what it is? All I can say is that we're missing, we don't have a complete file and they hang up on you because their asset manager is working for the bank, you know, and they're, I don't have something to check this box. Therefore it's incomplete. I'm just gonna let you go. And so you'll, as you get better at negotiating short sales and I don't want you to, because I don't want you to ever get good at this. Then you get in the point and you say, great, you go stand by your fax machine because they won't take email. Because email have dates and timestamps, so do fax machines, but now they're responsible for it because I've sent it to them and I have records of sending something to them or a fax I don't. So they prefer that. I'll say, great, you go stand by your fax machine. I'm going to send faxes to you right now. Ouch. Anyway, it's a waste of your time as a real estate professional. You go hire someone to do that negotiating for you. And I promise you, when it starts to get crazy again, there will be companies that negotiate the short sales. You hire them to do that piece of it and you give them 1% of your 3% and then you keep going finding more, more transactions. Anyway, win, win or no deal. The win to the seller, a buyer is easy. Buyers get a great deal on a house because they have credit and they have the ability and the means to pay for it. The seller, it blesses their life because they don't have a foreclosure on, excuse me, yeah, a foreclosure on their record. And that's a great thing. They've not been foreclosed on. Integrity, do the right thing. I hope I don't have to explain that one to you. But if it feels like, oh, I'm feeling icky doing this, you should probably consider not doing it. Customers always come first. I don't, I, I, that's one word I disagree with with KW, and that's just me. They're clients. Clients are friends. That's just me. But clients always come first. 
you guys are my clients. I'm an employee of this company, but I work for you, but I will not be abused. And I hope that you won't abuse me too, because it's that I'm also a client of yours because we work together and I'm your advocate. I work on your behalf as well. So don't abuse your clients. Commitment in all things, be committed. Yeah, I'm here. You guys are here and you're committed. Communication, seek first to understand. They stole that, which is not wrong. From whom? Where did you, where did you hear that? Commitment or communication, seek first to understand. Yeah, it's one of the seven habits of highly effective people. Stephen R. Covey from Utah Valley. Yeah, so really good stuff. Creativity, ideas before results. Sometimes counseling with others will make a difference. And so I would encourage that. Can I turn those lights down? Will that help? Moon guiding. I saw her, she was blinking and you always come first. All right, um, teamwork, together everyone achieves more. You've heard that before, that's what team is and all that. But if you think about it, you work on a team. You have coaches, you have, you, you guys are so lucky you have Angie. You know, some of you started with a really eh, guy from Lehigh, but um, all I'm saying is there, are, there are, we have strengths. And, and so I'd say work with our strengths, you know, and, and, and go after some, but work with your team. You have a TC that will really bless your life and help you with your paperwork. Doesn't mean that she's going to do all of that for you. It just happens to be Annette. She won't do it all for you, but man, she can make your life easy. She's going, are you sure you wanted to do this? It's always good to have that second set of eyes. That's why we talk about that teamwork piece. Trust starts with honesty, equity, opportunities for all. Now, as explained by our diversity, equity, and inclusion um, vice president, and she talks about it, it's not the same. In fact, turn around really quick. Look at the screen behind us. That is Julia Lachey. She is our director, uh, or our vice president of equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The whole thing, and her whole point is, it's not about what you hear about the woke mentality going on out there. She says, every client and every other agent is a human being. And that we need to treat each other as human beings. It's not about black or white or redhead, and I'm teasing. Um, it's not about brown or yellow or any other colors. It's not about religion or anything else, but everyone that wants a home should have a home. And we should be able to you know, find the means to help them get it. Even to the point where I was wrong on, at the MLS, I, I proposed that we take mobile home sales off of the MLS because it's, real, it's not real property, it's personal property. There is no, very rarely is there real property tied to that mobile home. It's a, it's a trader sitting in a park. That's why they call them trader parks and all that. But the whole point is they said, no, for some people, especially in this economy, that may be somebody's first home that they're able to purchase and own and actually build some equity. Because I've seen numbers on mobile homes. I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. I remember my sisters-in-law, both of them, they had mobile homes in that park that's just off of Provo Center Street um, and, the, and the freeway, just to the west and just a hair north. And they spent, one of them spent $5,000 for their place and the other spent six, and then they sold them for 15. You know, now they're selling for 70 and $80,000. Some over, depending on where you are, can be over $100,000 for a mobile home. Yeah, the world has gone crazy, but here we are. Last one, success results through people. And again, that's part of the teamwork thing, but it takes people. And so that we work together and that you will always find success working with others. And sometimes that's the teamwork piece of it where we're cooperating, you and a cooperating agent, buyers and sellers and all that, the results through people. Sometimes we leverage what we do. We may have somebody that... Um, schedules appointments for us and all we do is go on appointments you know so you have what's called an inside sales rep and isa sales agent who's making outbound calls or someone who's following up on all of your internet leads and all that turning them into 
real buyers and sellers that want to actually do something. So success results through people. We work together. This is a big deal. This is the foundation of our negotiations. And I promise you, you'll work with others that, that don't do that. Um, you, you'll find agents that are less than forthright to work with. And you'll be able to pick them out. And you'll go, huh, I remember once negotiating. I had an agent call me and he was screaming mad. And I'm a relatively new broker at the time. My agent was representing a listing and he was mad that my agent didn't select his offer. And I said, well, my agent took an offer that was paying more than your offer. And I know that you sell more in this neighborhood than any other agent, or so you say. But why, why would it make more sense for my agent's client to accept your offer? The seller's happy, the buyer's happy, and your buyer's not happy because your buyer didn't get it, but you were offering $10,000 less than the other offer. And he said, you guys in your win-win negotiations. And I said, really? Win-win or no deal? I said, it has to bless the life of the buyer or the seller. I said, what do you believe a professional negotiator does? And he says, a professional negotiator, someone works with me, they know, whoever's on the other side knows they got crushed by a better agent and a better negotiator and that that other person should have hired me. And that's why, that's what a professional is. I said, sounds like you and I will probably never be in business together. I, you know, I won't bring, I would never, I won't say never, I wouldn't bring him over unless this is something he can live with. Something I would hope, as you look at this, if you look at this and you say, gee, this just gives me the heebie-jeebies, I'm super uncomfortable with this. I, I would love to introduce you to other brokerages that might, might have different standards. Yeah, God, family, and then business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, that stood out to me, and that's actually why I chose this brokerage and didn't even have anybody else. I was like, I'm going to be cheesy, and I'm going to interview, and all this stuff. Chris was the first place I came. I got introduced. I talked to Tony. I met you, like all this stuff. I went here for eight. Tony and Susie should be enough. You don't, Just stop there. Yeah. I read that, and that's actually why I chose yeah. this Yeah, my, ment my mentor, Alan Wade, started Westfield Real Estate back in, the, back in the dark ages. He'd been a broker for about 10 years when I started in 2002. And it just felt right. And because this was who he was. And that was before we became the KW House in 2008. But he was looking for a training arm. He was looking for something that would help grow his brokerage. Um, Alan, since part of ways, he has his own broker. He just running his rental properties and he has stuff but I, I touch base with him still because this was him and that's what that's what got me into real estate and kept me in real estate you know is this is this philosophy so I think it's a good solid foundation and all that anyway moving on this is the path of negotiation and I we can these are cued and all that we write an offer it gets accepted go to close okay that's that's the easy path Sometimes there are a few wrinkles or a few road bumps and things we have to work through. What might be something that could interrupt a, the smooth flow? We want, look, this is what we want, but what, what might be some things here that we end up having to negotiate? Some simple things. Shower heads, a carpet allowance. So it could be, we may need a flooring allowance because ooh, this, you, uh, Instructors have walked back and forth and paced this. Shoney never paces. I, I don't know if there's different styles, right? We all have our styles. But this has probably been walked on more. These aisles have been walked on more. Yeah, this probably wouldn't be my first choice in carpet. But it's really good industrial stank. It lasts a couple of stains. You know, so yeah, we could have a carpet allowance or a cleaning allowance. What other things might be negotiated? What if we discover, what could be discovered when you're doing your, doing your due diligence? So again. Mold. Mold. Yeah. And then we have the mob upstairs. Who are they? They're not mold remediators. Meth mob. Meth mob is one of our tenants in the building. They run a business. They go, they, they look for methamphetamine. They go and they test a home for methamphetamine. They find it. They can go in and clean it. And all. 
So if the house has meth, that means it was probably tenants, and I'm totally teasing. Um, but somebody had used meth in, the, in that home, and so their, I would say their little tests go off. You know, so it's going off the meters, and you do it. Yeah. I heard that you don't even have to do meth in your house. Uh, if you get in someone's car, or you go to someone's house that uses meth, gets on your clothes, you go home, guess what? Yeah, you can introduce in your house. It usually that won't bring in levels that it will be detectable, but it won't be dangerous levels. That's you know. The instructor told me that was fine. They, yeah. Yeah, they, and they're like, nobody uses meth. Well, they were carpooling every day. So yeah. Somebody had done meth. Because meth will get into the fibers, anything that has fibers. And so you get to replace your carpet, your curtains, if there are high levels of meth, you get to replace all that stuff. And then. Or you, just, or you just have the seller take care of it. I would have the seller do it. No, it depends. Seller has no money. They can't do it. Or meth mob will actually work with sellers and say, look, we'll take it from the closing. If we know that there's enough margin that, that you can cover, they'll actually work with a seller that way too. And they'll take your payment later. Do you have to have the house done or it's just it, No, it has, to be, it has to be remediated. Meth doesn't go away. It can be, it can be deadly. And so... You know, because it's it's all of the chemicals that make the meth that make you go, ooh, okay, there are this the chemicals in there that, that are dangerous that they used to make it. Anyway, I don't want to get into have a meth discussion, but what I will say is it has to be tested. So part of their remediation process is they go back in, they test it again, making sure if, if the levels are super high, they actually have the ability to go in and put tape over the door and say, thou shalt not enter it. They report it to the county and the county will come and change the locks on the house or do whatever they have to to keep people from entering the property because it's at dangerous levels. You know, so that can happen. I have stories that I could tell you about meth. Just I'm just using that as an example, but meth or mold or something else. We just have a great company up there. They will sponsor some of our team meetings or lunches. And they'll come down and talk to you about, hey, we want to talk about meth. You know, and that's awesome. They, she doesn't have a bad accent like that. But, but that's certainly something that could be negotiated, okay? Let's, let's go something maybe more tame. Yeah. Yeah. So it was an older home then that had, yeah, so yeah, it had plugs that didn't have GFCI out, outlets because the GFCI, that, the ones where you push the reset buttons on, it's if you're anywhere near water, it it'll automatically snap and reset instead of blowing instead of blowing a circuit in your in your cap your electrical kit panel it'll blow the circuit right at the plug level so you don't have to run down into your basement or ha have to go find your electrical panel to reset that bad boy. Yeah. 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 If there are issues in your foundation. Those could be, and usually I'll say, if it's big enough that you can stick a quarter in it, that's that's one of those things. Usually it's like two quarters is, is when you think you, there could be an issue. Sometimes cement, I promise, will always crack, always does. So that's why you want to make sure, oh, you have a foundation issue. I had one guy, My one of my favorite listings, was it was a $900,000 listing, and we sold it for nine and a quarter. But the inspector came through and said, well, the foundation is really cracked through on the garage. And... My seller went ballistic. He goes, there's no way. And he goes, I demand. So I called the guy and I said, I need you to come on and show us the cracks in the foundation. It was the plaster, um, you know, that makes the cement look pretty. He goes, it's cracked. He goes, that's not foundation. That's plaster. That's all, you know what I mean? This, the, the decorative cement that was smeared on the foundation. There's no cracks in the foundation. Because they had, when they built that house, they had $50,000 of, restock fees on their lumber because they held each piece of lumber and they made sure it was straight and they kept sending lumber back look they're building their forever home and they did they only the only reason why they sold is they moved to st george so it was fun stuff but it was negotiated with this with the lumber company they said look we know that you're going to charge us restock fees send us your best lumber we don't want crap and so yep this one's not straight because you ever see wood bow well, what does it do to your walls and, you know, so then we want straight walls. So it was $50,000 of, 
they paid $50,000 in restock fees because they sent lumber back because the truck had to come back and pick it up when they brought the next load. And so they had to pay, you know, the guy to reload the truck. But, but it was worth it to them because that was not negotiable for them. Anyway, isn't negotiations just a, a blast? And we haven't even gotten into the fun stuff. So bottom line is, if it's rejected, we negotiate. If we accept it, we move to close. If it's rejected, we negotiate. And we find some that middle ground. So at this point, where, where should your heads be when we're negotiating? Your client's super emotional, really upset about something. How should you be? Yeah, you're going to be that rock. Look, they may be doing this, you know, in their emotions. You're going to do this. You're going to be, you can tell your clients, you guys get to be the duck on the water. And we're going to be the feet underneath doing this, helping propel you and get going. Because that's part of our job. And it's hard not to let their emotions jump onto us. So I'm just letting you know up front. Some of you have already had some of those experiences where your client's emotions may be a little bit high. But just understand that because you're working with people, it's going to be that way. I'm buying a house. And guess what? I'm excited. I'm emotional. You know, and so we're going through the, you know, all of that. All right. So ne to negotiate when with, we have with your client, if whether you're the listing agent or the other agent, and you have to negotiate with the other agent. Sometimes it'll be a for sale by owner, so you're negotiating with a sell with a with the principal directly. So these are the principals, the sellers, and the buyers. Agents are agents of a buyer, agent of the seller, and then agents are negotiating between each other. Makes sense? So as in as professionals, we get to do at least two levels of negotiations. We're going to negotiate with the other party, and we're going to be negotiating with our own party, with our client. Because again, sometimes buyers, our buyers or our sellers might be just a hair crazy in, in their demands. See, Leo was all excited. I was going to buy his house for two mil until he finally had to wait 20 years to get it. Yeah. Right? Because in 20 years, do you think there's an outside chance your $400,000 property might be worth more than two mil? Say, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really will. Because usually about every seven years that the value will double on your home. There's that rule of seven. And so every seven to 10 years. What is that? Yeah. There you go. No naughty neighbors. Yeah. So is that is that land or just houses? And it's not the the rule of seven. That's really more for investments, and so it's probably closer to ten years that it would double for land. for for a house for your house, not land. Land could go, land could stay stagnant or it could go crazy, depending on what's going on. Right now, do you think dirt? Do you think the value of dirt's gone up or down? Why? They're not making any more dirt. That's the other part of it too, right? And yet, right now, I don't think people are jumping jumping off buildings to buy land, except those that are saying, I can get land at a discount. I promise you, you're going to have investors holding on, and they're going to wait. Are you when I'm done? Um, there are folks that are waiting for an even more depressed market, and it could be coming. It depends on which economist you're listening to. I listen to one who's super, super negative. He's pretty political too. And so he's, you know, coined that phrase Bidenomics. Um, Bidenomics. 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 He's not a fan, is all I'm saying. Um, but what I'm saying is it depends on who you're listening to. I don't know anybody saying, oh, the economy is just awesome. I don't know anyone that's thinking that right now. But if you listen to the president's team, man, you'd think that we haven't been in a better situation. And I, it's somewhere in between. True? I know that you know, just 
gas to put in my dang truck costs a whole lot more than it did, you know, before he took over and shut down all the pipelines and stuff. That's that's one thing. And again, I'm not I'm try, sorry to get on apologies. I'm not trying to. What I'm saying is things have changed. The price of food has gone up just a hair. Um, maybe we'll all be vegan by default, you know, but food is getting more expensive. Anyway, all of that stuff. Common points of negotiation. Again, we talked about it, but I'm delighted you guys already knew that because this is important. Price and terms, usually the primary factor, but it isn't always the primary. Back in the day when you could use, when I say you could use, we really couldn't, people would use love letters. Are you familiar with love letters? Okay. Love. They could be, they could be housing violations, you know, housing, urban development, fair housing. Is, is what we're worried about. Hi, we're a little family, you know. Just say, you can write what, you can do whatever you'd like. We, I just won't present it. Now, there are ways around that. If you really want to get a love letter in, you, there are ways around it. But be very careful because, I'll give you an example. I had some agents that were selling um, a house, or excuse me, they were representing a buyer. And the buyer happened to be um, a single mom. The seller, well, the seller, the listing agent said, please send love, you know, send love letters. We want to know about you know, your situation. Da, 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 da. And the agent called back or texted back, so put it in writing. And it wasn't one of our agents, said, Hey, we the sellers accept another offer. It was just a hair lower than yours, but they fell in love with it because she's ready to have, you know, have a little baby and they just wanted their house to go to someone that had a little family. That's really hard for that single mom. Well, what about my little family? And we offered more and you admitted it. Do you see a fair housing challenge? And that can be anywhere from twenty dollars to $30,000 or fine, maybe only five or $10,000 fine. Do you see why I'm saying be very careful? That would be a slam dunk. That wouldn't even be a challenge. We've had some fair housing complaints. If you know Peter Morkel, if you ever listen to Peter Morkel, you'll know that he probably is not a, um, a resident native of this country. He's actually from South Africa. And so I tease and call Peter an African-American. He's about as Caucasian as they come, but um, he is from South Africa and he literally is an African-American. But um, there was somebody, and so he went through and lived through apartheid, and so he understands racism and all that. And so those are issues. But somebody had actually filed a HUD complaint against him. He had to defend it. He says for two weeks he didn't sleep. He was so worried about it. But it was a woman that called and called the front desk and said, can you tell that I'm not an American by my accent? I mean, that's how she, that's, how, that's where the phone call came from. But if he had multiple offers. He took the best offer. And, you know, but he was able to show because this is why, just reminding you, every offer you write, you keep a copy of. On your listings, every offer that comes in, you keep a copy of so that you can show that those offers were presented because it came back, you know, about six, eight months after he closed on the deal. But he got his buyers the best deal. They closed on it. And she claimed that it was because she was from um, Argentina. Argentina, um, that he didn't accept her offer. And he, he was offended personally. He says, I understand the apartheid. You never talked to me because then you would know that I'm also not a Native American. You know, I, have an, I also have an accent. You know, anyway, it was, they, as soon as he sent all the stuff, sent all the documentation, they just sent back, note, thank you, we're done. It was, you know, but two weeks of, oh, they're reviewing it, they're, you know, from the time you got the complaint and all of that. So it's painful, we have to be careful. And so, but I did, I've had people where I sent a love letter once, not because I wasn't thinking and I was a newer agent. Um, some clients of mine, um, I'm sorry, we received a love letter. And this guy said, this family, they wanna stay in the neighborhood and your home came up, they want your home to raise their family. And we had another offer that was really close. It was a hair under, but it was a cash offer, no contingencies, and it was going to close in two weeks. She was out to here pregnant, 
kind of looks like me now, but she was very pregnant and wanted to get moved on to her next place. And it was really tempting to take that cash offer. But these guys were buying, they had a pool of homes were selling for about $200,000 to $300,000. And they had, I think, $80 million to buy houses in Utah. They were buying everything they could get their hands on. This particular, this, it was a conglomerate. They were doing kind of what you've seen BlackRock do and buying everything that they can get their hands on because they wanted it for just a bunch of rentals. You know, those guys that were buying then, I can't even imagine how much money they've made if they, you know, the value of their portfolio, how big it is, you know, today, because this is 10, 15 years ago when they did this. But anyway, my clients took the lower offer or they took, a, it was a hair better offer, but they took it primarily because it was someone that was going to stay in the neighborhood. They wanted to rent not to um, a landlord. They wanted to rent to someone that was actually going to occupy the house. So you can write a letter. You can, but I will not present, I will not present it as a listing agent. Well, you could just say, thank you so much for letting us, you know, for letting us walk through your home. As soon as you say we, or I love the home, now assumptions start going off in the mind of the recipient. Right. And so you just can't. I've had I had one. I had 30 offers on a town home in Spanish Fork. This, again, is in crazy town um, a few years back. And one of them is my special needs son, you know, really wants to live here because we're only two minutes away from his doctor's office. And we need to. You know. And I just sent it back to the agent and said, I'm not going to present this love letter. I'll, I will present your offer. You know, you just can't. So. If there's, if it, because it has to be, it can't be a fair housing issue. I just can't present a fair housing issue. And I can't sub subject my sellers to a fair housing complaint because they can get fined as well as the agents. And it just gets ugly and I don't want that. So anyway, moving on. Terms, financial terms, time-based or both. See, but the, and then, I would say, and stuff, because stuff is the other thing that it could be. There's one, there's it. So terms is everything else. Anyway, so I know that we're, we're harping on this, but that's where we get, I'm sorry, I have a million stories and I apologize. Any ahas from what we just talked about? There's price and terms, and we have our wife, excuse me, the wife or C2TES, our foundations. I hope that if you guys walk away with anything, you go, dang, we have a company that actually stands for something. You work for that kind of an organization. If you were to violate win, win, or no deal, if you were to do something, I had, I had an agent that was supposed to have collected $50,000 of earnest money because he was the buyer and he didn't, he didn't deposit it. And I said, where is it? Well, I didn't deposit. Why not? Well, you know, we, we couldn't sell. We were trying to sell the contract. He was trying to, you know, do this um, wholesaling thing. He was new at it, and I just said, "That's great. I think maybe best for you to be officed elsewhere, because it doesn't make sense for us to work together. You're putting too you're putting too much risk on a brokerage and on my license. And I kind of want to, I'm one of those weird guys. I want to die with my license. You know, it doesn't mean I'll be doing real estate all my life, but I will die with my real estate license intact." Just because I like doing it. Anyway, other thoughts so far? Okay, let's keep on moving then. The three P's of negotiation. These are fun. You prepare, present, and position your docs. So preparation, again, it's a key to building confidence and ensuring a smooth negotiation process. So we're going to be super prepared. We're going to present it in such a way as there's two ways of presenting. What I said, there's two things we want to present. One, I want to present it so that my buyer, if I'm present a buyer, my buyer gets the house or that my client gets what they want. But I also want to present it in a way that the other principal gets what he, she, or they want as well. You know, dear buyer, your offer that came in $100,000 below our list price was cute. And so we're going to counter offer at list price plus 10000 because we really want our price and it's important to us, but we think we can find a number that might work for us both. But I've done that before too. 
I once literally had somebody came in, they were almost 100,000 below our offer price. So we literally, we were listed at 400, they came in at 310, 90,000 off. And so we just counter offered at 410. Why not? Look, I laughed, the other agent laughed, the other agent after first was mad. And I said, well, you present me a real offer, I'll present you a real counter offer. How about that? Well, it's insulting, but you just gonna go, okay. But I understand what you want. Thanks for sending it. Most people don't negotiate. Most people just send offers. And say, hey, how would you like, if you were a buyer agent, how would you like to be, be able to differentiate, differentiate yourself from all other buyer agents? Would you be interested? Let me walk you through a process. But it takes some preparation and it's all about the presentation. So when I ask the closing question, write the closing question down. That's the only one you care about. And I'm gonna talk about Bin and Sung Hee, my, my buyers. And I walk in there, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, thank you so much for letting me come in your home. Lucas, your agent, you know, is aware that I don't represent you, I represent my buyers, Bin and Sung Hee. But he allowed me to come in and present my offer to you. I'll, my clients offer to you and I appreciate you being here, you know, making time for me. But I said, and we'll talk about preparation in just a second. Bin and Sun here are a wonderful couple. Again, are there fair housing issues going on? Probably. Because they're a great couple. She's out to her pregnant. She fell in love with the kitchen, but husband, Ben fell in love with that shop. The shop. He loves that big garage, that detached garage where he can put all of his, you know, working stuff and materials. And he just wants to, to be in there. And so they, they've got a family. They want to have more. And it's going to be, this is like the perfect house, perfect neighborhood. Everything works. Now, their offer is not a full price offer, but it's really close. But the benefit to you is if you accept their offer, You'll be able to take your house off the market. You won't have to, mom, keep this house spotless and dust free while having to show this house over and over, you know, for that next buyer to come in, hoping that you get your price because we're coming in about 10,000 off your price because we came in really close to full price and we asked for 10,000 in closing costs. And so, and I pushed, so I pushed a copy to Lucas. I'm picking on you, Lucas. And I said, so, this is their offer. Is this an offer you can work with? Now, if Lucas were a super experienced agent, he would say, Dean, thanks for coming. We'll get back to you. But what was my question? Is this an offer you can live with or work with or live with? Either way it works. Is this an offer you can work with? And over there, like, well, I don't know. I don't know if we can give up 10. We might be able to give up five. Is that information Lucas would have ever given me? Uh-uh. That's why I present offers. But if you as a buyer agent were to go and present offers to a seller, and it's a pretty easy one, I want to introduce you to my buyers. That's, that's, the, that's the, we're laying the foundation. What did they like about the house? What, what do they see themselves doing living in the house? Something, make it personal, make them real people, not just a, this is a sheet of paper with offer, an offer on it. And then, if, even if it's a full price offer, and we are putting on a full price offer, they're fully qualified, you get to take your house off the market and you don't have to worry because they will close. Now, here's some preparation part I was talking about. I went to Ben and Sung He, my buyers, I said, do you trust me? Well, sure, we trust you, Dean, we're working with you. I said, great. I want you guys to sign a blank addendum. This is a blank addendum. I'm gonna go out to my car, and I told Lucas this when I on this particular one that this case that I worked with. Lucas, I'll be out in my car. Why don't you guys talk? Let me know what we need to do because I have them on the phone and I can have an addendum to make sure that we have the offer that you guys will accept. Is that okay? Would that work for you, Lucas? Yeah, see, I'll, I'll, I'll work. And that's good because what they did is they talked. I said, I'm just to sit out in your driveway, so just let me know so I can call my clients with what they want. Lucas called me, I'm just picking on Lucas, he called me and said, Dean, they'll do the deal if you'll take just 5,000 in closing costs instead of 10. I already knew they would do it with no closing costs. So I said, well, let me call them. So I called and said, 
hey, just want you to know we're going to get the house, but I'm, I, have to, I have to drop this addendum to let you know I'm going to put on there seller to pay only 5000 in closing costs. You know, I, I just amended my amendment and asking for closing costs. And they said, yeah, go ahead. So I walked out and I said, put it, I knocked on the door. Luke's, you know, Lucas answered the door and said, yeah, here, I told you I had the addendum ready to go. Here it is. Let me know when we're under contract. I wasn't home before I got that call from that listing agent said we're under contract. Does that make you different as a buyer agent? Yeah. Present offers. That's my that's a recommendation. There are very few agents. I can think of only one or two other agents in the valley that really will do that. But if you will do that, and so what you have to do is you have to schedule it with the listing agent when they can be there. I have done it with agents on speakerphone because I start with, I am not your agent. I don't represent you. And I'm picking at you as if you were a couple. Say, so, Melissa Leo, I don't represent you. I represent Ben and Sung Hee. I just want to make sure that, that we're really clear because Lucas is your agent on that. And Brindley's his, his broker, but she didn't train him to say, hey, shut up, don't say it. And I'm teasing. Because, but you have to understand, my mentor taught me this. And what happened one time is he literally said, he came and was presented an offer to my sellers. And I said, when he asks you, is this an offer you can work with or live with, you just stop and you look at me. I said, I don't want you to say anything. No, but what does Pete say, my, my seller? Well, I don't know. I said, Pete. And he went, oh. And he looked at me. And I said, Alan, thank you. And I said, we'll get back to you. Because you want to be that professional. You don't want your clients talking to the other agent. But I want them talking to me. Right? Did the listing agent ever say no to Yeah, there'll be some. And just deal with it. I understand that some listing agents are, I won't say too lazy. They don't want to take the time because it is time consuming on their part. But I'm, I'm, we're talking about negotiations. Do you care what the listing agent thinks or feels? No. So you do or don't want them to talk to you? I, I, I want them to talk to me all day. I want information. All right. Yeah, but if I'm representing a buyer, oh dang, I want to, I want to, I'm, if, yeah. So let's do this. Uh, Chris, will you play with me? Ask the question Is this an offer you can work with? Well, all right. Ask me again. Oh, heck no. Did you get different information from the way I said no? Right. See, we're in Utah Valley, we say heck here. <laughs> it's her agent. Yes. No, no. It's no, in this case, I'm, I'm the buyer agent. She was the seller in this case. I was just you, just doing an example. But if you, oh, sorry, buyer agent, seller. I was simply a seller. Sorry. I was just being a seller. She just asked me, will that work for me? If I said, no, no. What did, it, what did I just tell you? Do you think I'm close? There, there's an outside chance I might be able to get this deal done tonight, right? But if it's like, no, that's a ridiculous offer. We want you to pay us more. Brenda, you're not asking. Okay, I, I didn't know if you were, okay, good, good. Okay, okay. No, but does that make sense? There's a difference in there, no. Or, well, I think we could make, say again. She was asking me, I'm the, I'm the buyer, I'm the seller in this case. She was asking me, you want to know what the question was? Yeah, you called the listing agent and you said, I'd like to schedule an appointment with your seller because I want to present my, my buyer's offer. And I promise you, you'll have more listed to go, excuse me? You want to do what? Yeah, I want to present the offer. Because what you have here is something from a bin and a sung he, and I don't even know what a sung he is. Okay, she's Korean. But I want to make sure that I'm, you know what I mean? I want to be able to present the offer. Well, can you tell me about the offer? No, I'm going to present the offer. 
but I'll give you a copy. As soon as they have a copy, you'll have a copy because I always print out two copies of the agreement so they both get it. But in my car, I have that addendum. Let me listen to that. It says, they trust me. They've already sent it. See, that's that preparation piece of it. I've already prepared because I want a smooth trans transaction. And if they don't trust me, then I won't do it. I, I'll present the offer, but I'll just say, I'll call you guys and I'll have an addendum that I can DocuSign over to you and we'll type it up, we'll do it. But it could take an extra day or two. In the meantime, what if another offer came through? It stinks to be you. You know, and so buyer, if you have to sleep on it, you likely won't sleep in it. I literally had one happen last week. Had a buyer, really wanted a house. And now we're going to sleep on it. I said, okay. And we finally got the offer written on Friday. Because we walked through it on Thursday. They, they liked it. They wanted it. They had to sleep on it. Friday, they, I called the listing agent. And he got back to me that evening. He says, the seller leased the property out. He decided not to sell. But had we had an offer that made sense for him, you know, it's crazy town. Yes, ma'am. And I don't know either because <laughs> I'm coming into this cold. If you're a buyer's agent and you're talking to the listing agent, either case, I feel like you give up a lot of information that I wouldn't be willing to give if I was a listing What? How do you know what to give and what not to give? If what you say could hurt your client's negotiating position, you should do it. Yeah, and so guess what? You need to let your clients know that. I need to let that. You need to let who who do you represent? Okay. I'm gonna steal this. This is this came from now you don't have to take the certified negotiation expert class and I'm teasing. One thing I absolutely love, he or she who is, has the greatest need is in the weakest negotiating position. He who has the greatest need, I'm the seller, I have to sell my house or I can't move on to my next house. I've already got a house under contract. I have to sell, okay? Am I desperate as a seller? I have to sell it, yeah, I do. Is there a chance I may give up something? Yeah, I may give up. Usually it's going to be in price. And it may be I have to close. And maybe I, may be in a, I may, be, may even have to move out, live somewhere temporarily so the buyer can get in right now. It's crazy town. You listing agents have to watch out. Don't be a dope. Do your open house for another agent. Mm -hmm. Months of work. Well, everything's negotiable. That's really it. You know what? If, but I would never say, "Oh, yeah, they." She was just widowed, and and so she really, she just there's too many members in the house for her. Well, no, I just hurt my seller, right? I don't want to do that. Or, yeah, my buyer was, you know, he just he was just widowed, and so now he's looking for a townhome that he doesn't have to he need a whole lot of space, and so. I, I, he would really love it if you would sell it to him. You know, he, he needs, and he doesn't have a lot of money because he didn't have life insurance on her, even though she was the primary breadwinner. And that's happened before, and all that. But you know what I mean? All I'm saying this: Am I giving up too much information? The seller's going, uh, "Yeah, now I know he has a real need and he really wants the place. I'm not going to come off my price, even though I tried to make him feel sorry for me. I'm not going to feel sorry for you. They may." But usually they won't because it's by the time it gets communicated by a listing agent to the seller, the seller is going to start weeping. Oh, no. Oh, great. These guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's important. So let's talk about preparation really quick. And I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. Know your goal. This is the hard stuff. And I'll make sure that we get these slides to you guys, too. What you should do, if you will, bug hunter just because he has access to all of this. Say, Hunter, we want the slides, we want the, the workbooks. You should have, you should have gotten, and I'm betting if you go through your, um, your Notion page somewhere on there, there's links to all of the Ignite courses, the coursework and all of that. 
but the instructor booklet has everything and it has all ask these questions. <laughs> so it has the red letters as well as the black letters. You know, but again, and you'll also, if you have access to the instructor book, you should also have access to the slides. But um, know your goal. What is your goal as an agent? If you represent a seller, what is your goal? Sell the dang house, okay, at absolute top dollar for your client. That's your, that should be your goal, but what is your client's goal? Do, do sellers always have to have the absolute top dollar? No, terms may be more important to them than top dollar. Uh, Exactly. He was like, tell him it's all the dirt. And I'm sitting there like, do you want to live here now? Yeah, it makes you wonder. So again, and I love this stuff here too. Think ahead. You know, what's the long, what's the long game? You know, and then set clear expectations for your client and for the other side. Hey. I have no idea. I thought feed the mice, you know? <laughs> All right. Um, being informed. And again, this is part of that. When you're setting the foundation with your buyer or your seller, say, look, I need you to disclose everything that I need to know so that we're not caught unawares in making that, helping you get the house you want or helping you sell your house. Because my job as a listing agent is to help you find the one person on planet earth who will pay more for your house than anybody else. And isn't that what you want? I say, yeah. See, isn't that a good tie down? You know, but I please obey the laws. I'm shocking. Don't lie. And then know the documents inside out. That's why I need you, need you, need you to do your case studies. Sit down with Annette when she comes in in the afternoons. <laughs> Jeanette, excuse me. Annette is my title girl. Sorry, Jeanette. And go through that. Jeanette and Angie are great. If there's stuff that they go, whoa, that's a Dean question, come talk to me about it too. I'm happy to, if I'm available, just my, I usually have the green sign on my door, come in and just ask questions. I'm happy to work with you on stuff like that. Okay, but know your dang docs. Because, well, Dean, when are we supposed to close? I'm going, um, section 24 of the REPSI actually has your settlement deadline date. So you'll want to do that, right? When do you settle? Settling is when you, Sign docs, closing is when it funds and records. You can't fund and record without signing. And that's all defined in part three of the REPC. Okay, settlement and, and closing are two separate definitions, but everybody in their pooch says closing, right? When are you guys gonna close? I don't know, it's when it funds and records, right? So know your stuff. So asking the right questions. That's part of your preparation. And that's why I said, get to know your clients. What is their biggest goal? Scale of one to 10. Do you even care about where you live? Well, sure. You know, that's, that's a 10. Great. Where do you, and then where do you not want to live? As I mean, yeah, I don't want to be backed up to railroad tracks. Well, then quit looking at houses by railroad tracks, you know, because that, that happens all the time, unless you've just changed your mind. I always tease and say flyers, Flyers, important, unimportant. Flyers on a house, if you're, if you're a listing agent. Should you have flyers? Yes, no? Why do you say no? Yeah. It's, just like, it's like this. Why would I want, I'm going to put, I can have a flyer maybe with some pictures. Here's a flyer, but here's why. Seriously. <laughs> Hate this house, but man, you should have seen the flyer. I bought the house. I, I had to have it. 
Flyers don't sell the house. They provide information. I don't put a, I don't put a box with flyers out in front of the house. There's a QR code, so they have to call me. As soon as they scan it, I'll have their information. And so I can, I, because I want to call and say, hey, you scanned, you got information about this house, wanted to follow up, find out what made you want it or not want it. Because what if they don't have an agent? Wait, I'm just curious, who's your agent? Oh, well, we just started looking. Awesome. What if you had someone working for you that could find you the best value for your dollar? Would you even be interested? Because that's me. They're not going to buy your listing. They're buying something else. Do you want a buyer? Remember Angie talked about how many, how many sales should you get from every listing? At least two, because you should get a buyer from every listing that you take. The buyers will come. That's why she said be a listing agent and all that. Okay, asking great questions. Um, and you want to know what leverages your client. My client has $100,000 to put down. So my client actually... We could really make this sweet for you, seller, but I'm not going to tell you, seller, up front that we have $100,000 to put down. I'm going to give you as little information as, as a buyer agent. I'm not telling the seller. I'm not putting all my cards on the table yet unless my buyer tells me to. Look, we're such a strong buyer. You should use us. You should buy us because appraisal is not going to be an issue because we're putting 100000 down. We could even be off because we have the cash to make up the difference if that's what, what was needed. Does it make sense? All these pieces are negotiable. Find out what is their goal? What do they want? My goal and their goal. And then this is why we have to ask, ask questions. And so in the book, I promise you this, this is why I want you to have the Ignite book. There's checklists of this questions that you should ask, be asking your buyers. I have some. Send me an email. I'll send you Dean's buyer questions. Say, Dean, I want your buyer questions. You email it to me. I'll, I'll shoot it back to you. I have it set up as a, a Google, uh, not an auto reply, but um, one of their templates, a Google template. It's super easy. I just click on it. And it spits out my magic questions. You know, what, you know, where do you want to live? Do you have something to sell? Master what? Negotiating. All, you All of it. Well, but I've been doing it. I've, I've been doing it for two decades. That's part of it. But all I'm saying is, when you know what questions to ask, I'm going to send Scarlett. If you had a list of questions to send me, would that make you feel good? Say yes. So send me all the questions that I would want as a buyer. So you say, Dean. I'm not not Dean the AG, Dean the broker. It's Dean the the buyer out there. You say, you know what? I have a a list of questions that I like to ask every buyer. Would that be okay if I sent that to you? So that when we come to our meeting, you have these questions and you know answers in your head. So I'm going to prepare you to come to our, our buyer consultation. So now all you do is you have your list of questions. Let's go through the questions. Were there any questions you didn't understand? And all that. Can you handle that one? Or was there anything you didn't understand? And then. Well, I mean, if I was. Yeah. But then I'm going, dang, Scarlett asked you all these hard questions. What? Tell me about your kitchen. Tell me about your garage. Tell me about your master bedroom. You know, what's it? The primary bedroom. Sorry. Um, I do. I do. I do. It's a man. I'm the master of the house. When my wife lets me, you know, so. There are, no, it's because some people are saying, oh, that must be racist because you said master. I didn't say massa. I say master bedroom all the time. You'll see more in printed materials now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. But I can give you some questions for buyers, but there's questions for sellers. You should know some of those too. Like for investors, I have a presentation for investors. But what it is is, first of all, are you looking, so tell me about your investors really fast. Tell me, tell me about one of your goals really fast. One. Right. If the world were perfect, 
all right, so you need to know something. So for investors, it's a different conversation. Let's talk about it a little bit later because it's one particular client. But do you need to have a conversation about each of those? Remember, because what do I ask about? All right, Lucas asked me what I do for a living. I'm a pushy realtor. I help people buy, sell, and get rich by investing in real estate. I better have a conversation for buyers. I better have a conversation for sellers and maybe a conversation for investors or people that want to get rich by investing in real estate. And so I have that presentation. And, there, and that one's a pretty brief one because it's just like, okay, what are you currently doing? So here's, here's my investor presentation. You ready? What are you currently doing? What kind of returns are you getting? And if you could get 10 to 20% on your money, would you? No, we have, to, we have to know there's there's more. And then now we have to buy the right property in the right neighborhoods. There are those that will say, now again, this is philosophy thing. Those that will say, yeah, you never buy condos. I think condos are great because someone's taking care of the yards and all of that. Same thing with townhomes and all that. So there's there's that. But the negative is there's an HOA. And so you you pay for that. But I didn't have to go and hire someone and worry about hiring someone to remove the snow and do all that work. So it depends on your style. So do you want to be a hands-on owner or do you want to be hands-off? Do you want to put, and what I would tell people too, part of it is, look, you hired someone to manage your money, hire someone to manage your investments, your investment properties. Quit trying to do it all yourself. So there's that. And then buying the right properties. Um, the Robert Kiyosaki, read rich, rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Man, Poor Man? I can't remember. Okay. Bottom line, Kiyosaki was really good. He said, yeah, you buy homes that are probably built in the 50s or 60s because they'll still hold their value. You can get them inexpensively, remodel them, but he's always a buy and hold guy. If your style is, I want to fix and flip, I'm not your agent. There's too much stress in that for me. So I'm not your agent. Um, if you could get 15 to 20% on your money, would you? Would you be interested? Because if we can start talking about that. If you could get 15% returns on your money, we'll, we'll talk. You can't talk <laughs> We're negotiating. And so, anyway, oh my heck. So I'm so sorry, guys. I'm taking all your time, but I love this stuff. I love negotiations and it's fun. But is it, can I tell you what negotiations really is? Isn't it a conversation? I was talking about stuff. Not telling you some anecdotes, but it's asking the right questions. Yes. I will always, well, I have my, if I'm going to, if I'm going to email an offer, let's say I'm being the typical lazy agent. I do that a lot. I'm going to email the offer. I'm not going to be presenting the offer because there's a good chance that my, my offer may not get accepted as written. I will cover, you know, my cover email letter, just my note, my email, right? Hey, please see attached an, an, an amazing offer from my client. And you can use all that. I have an offer for my client if it's a, a low offer. If it's, if it's 10, 20,000 below, it's saying, I will have already had a conversation with the listing agent. Help me understand why this home is priced when the comparable properties that have sold in the neighborhood are significantly lower. You know, how, what, was it 14 carat or 24 carat gold leaf they put in the, the moldings around the ceilings? You know what I mean? I'm serious. I, I just want to say, I want to understand, you know, how you can justify it just because it has to appraise. And so I don't want to have a fight when we get to an appraisal. And so that's kind of what I'll do. I'll find out, oh, you used this comparable property that's eight miles away. Okay. And, and I've seen those too. They send me comps that are not even close to that neighborhood. They're different. So that makes it's important for you to drive the neighborhood, know the neighborhood, you know, as you do that and figure out where are the borders as you drove and walked your buyer through the property, kind of look for the borders so that when you go back to do a, a market analysis, to see, is this really, 
a super niche market where, um, dang it, up in the, the Provo foothills, and I can't remember some of these subdivisions, they have condos, townhomes that are, I say they're attached homes. They're, they're what, do you, what do you call them? It's an attached home. Well, it's not a duplex because you're only buying half of it. Twin, thank you. It's a twin or a town because it could be three or more attached together if it's, it's a town. But these homes are attached and start going, um, they're all eight, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000 and have been for the last 15 years. And so I'm saying, okay, there's something about that subdivision is different than all the houses around it that are selling for about these single family homes on big lots, big dogs. And... So then I have to know that that's kind of what's happening in that neighborhood. So you need to know something about it. But I would ask, but if you can't find anything comparable, you have to ask the listing agent and say, help me understand. You know, in your listings too, as listing agents, you can put some good comparable properties. Say, here are some comparables that I use to help my seller determine the price. And sometimes the agent will literally tell you, you know what? That's just what the seller wants. And I want a radio flyer wagon. You know, and if you're old enough to know what that is, they think it's funny. All right. Open versus closed in questions. We're not going to go through the exercises. What's the difference? Thank you. Closed. Yes or no? Do we eventually want to get to a yes or no? Yeah, we want to get to that yes. So it might be, what would it take for me to list your property this evening? What would it take? Just the, the, what would it take is always a good one just to start. If the world were perfect, when would you move? See, that's kind of a closed question because, well, my husband's already started his job out of state. I had someone that moved to Indiana and you go, so yeah, how about let's get it sold yesterday. Should we ask for it? the extreme end, the high end of the mar market if she wants to move yesterday? Or should we say, let's come down ten or $10,000 or $15,000? That would probably be a more realistic price to get someone more interested now. You know, so those are the kind of questions as you again, trying to find out what their goals are and all that. Open and closed questions, what would happen if? Why is it important? We're just drilling down to find out motivations. On a scale of one to 10, Great way to figure out motivations. How motivated are you to, to, to sell your property? You know, there's the, the fluffy ones. Gosh, Jenna, can you just imagine you and the boys sitting in front of this fireplace, you know, on that cold winter night? And wouldn't that just be awesome? Because, and then as you sit there and think about it, you say, and I'm here because Dean helped me sell my house at, for the right price at the right time and then got me into this one because we chose to join forces and work together. Doesn't that sound great? See, that's a yes question. So why don't we go ahead and let's do the paperwork that it would take to get your home sold so that we can get you to Happy Hollow on time. You see what I mean? Why don't we? You see, it's, it's an invitation and that's just a negotiation. We're just inviting people to, do, to work with us and all that. Why is it, we're, we're drilling down. So the take action piece of it, work with a partner we're not going to do that today now we're talking about presenting call the other agent listen to some of the dumb things they say thank you chris right because they'll say dumb stuff right because we're going to present the offer pay attention to their cues keep quiet once you present an offer because a lot of times they're just presenting an offer to the other agent and i would so if it's to an agent instead of saying is this an offer you can work with do you think this is an offer your sellers can work with if you're presenting it to the agent. But I would have a, a conversation if I can. Say, this is, we're thinking, and sometimes you will well, veil things. We're thinking it'll be in this ballpark. We're thinking that we'll put X amount down, but I'll send you the offer. Are we even close? Are we so far off that we shouldn't write the offer? If they tell you you shouldn't write the offer, first of all, they're in violation of laws because they can't, they shouldn't tell you to not write an offer. Yeah. 
You do. You must. It, it is a law. Yeah, but it's, it's a negotiation practice. It's a bluff. And he may not. And yet that's on him. And I, always said, I would send in my email when I send over the offer, I would like written confirmation from your seller that he's seen the offer. Or I need you to tell me that you've presented the offer. If he puts in writing that he did not present the offer, now that's I have an email that I'm sending up to the Division of Real Estate. Straight up. So that's a whole other thing. Um, listen carefully to what's important to the other party. What's important to you guys? What, what do you guys want? S stay calm and relaxed, even if they're not. That happens. Focus on your customers and the other client's need. Right? Seller can't walk away upside down unless they have no other option. Right? So don't say, hey, I need, I want, I need it for free. Yeah, good luck with that. You know, it won't happen. So anyway, and then you want to always give your offer the best chance. Here's my negotiation, sage wisdom. Are you ready? Be the last one. I tell my clients this one. I want to be the last one to walk away from the negotiation table. If we can't negotiate it, it's because the other party could not live with what we're offering. We kept trying. We kept trying to come down. We kept trying to whatever, if it's my buyer. As a seller, we came down as much as we could. But they're insisting on they want more. You give them the inch, they want the mile, and I'm willing to give them a foot. You know, then then I'm fine with that. But we came as far as we could. Yeah. Um, so I know, like, they usually present an offer to me and my client. Uh -huh. I'm obligated to show them the offer, but we're not obligated to respond that. So like, we're not going to speak like we're separate. You're not because if you don't respond, if you you know, I have a deadline, except I don't. Um, I have a deadline on accepting accepting those offers. And so if the deadline was 5 p.m. today, or let's say 7 p.m. today, because I'm normal, don't say 5 p.m. deadlines. People work until 5 or 6, right? And so if, if, they, if they literally are handcuffed to their desk, I'm sorry, figuratively handcuffed to their desk, and they don't leave till 5, it won't be till 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock before they can even look at the offer with their agent. So I always would say 7, 7.30 p.m., 8 o'clock p.m. so that they can respond. Unless it's unless there's an urgency to do so. To say, hey, this is such a good offer listing agent. We're only giving till five because they're gonna look on, they're gonna move on. They their need is not that great. But they really they did like the house enough that they wanted to write the offer. And if you accept their offer, we're done. We're not looking at any other houses. I don't have to show any more homes. You know, whatever it is, right? But that's how I you don't have to because if you pass the expiration date, you can't accept the offer anyway. You can counter offer next month and come back and say, hey, would you guys consider, you know, we want to accept your offer. We'll change the dates, but would you guys come back? You can counter offer any day, right? And come back. See, most times we think, oh, you missed the acceptance deadline. See, that's what it is. You missed the response deadline. There is no such thing in a contract. Get that out of your mind. No such thing as a response deadline. There's only an acceptance deadline. They either accepted it or they rejected it. A counter offer is a rejection with what a term or price that we have to have, right? I always do. I always do know because I think that's professional. I think it's unprofessional. Something I've had to, I worked through Crazy Town. We had, you know, I had 20 offers on one of my listings. So I had two letters drafted that I had my seller sign. My sellers happened to be in St. George and their house was in Spanish. So we had to do it long distance, but I had them sign two letters. One letter was, thank you for your offer. We've chosen to accept a different offer and we're sorry you didn't get it. We'd like to hold your offer. And just in case there's a hiccup here on, on the primary. I just sent that to two, two by, so we had 20. So we had the accepted offer. So 19 and 18 got that one. They were, they were at the top of the list. And then 17 down to one, got the, thanks for your offer. We've chosen to go a different way and we wish you the very best in your luck in finding a house. But they got a signed letter. Each of those listing agents got a signed letter from my sellers saying, thanks for the offer. I didn't go through and make them initial every single repsy and all that. They got a letter saying, we received your client's offer. That's an easy, easy button. I learned that about five years ago, six years ago. 
when we started seeing more multiple offers. Because I don't want to make an initial six pages of a repsy, how many pages of addenda to say no? How about just sign a letter saying no? Even if I have two offers, a letter is so much nicer. Saying, we've looked at another one, but if it's okay, we'll hold your offer. We're not, we're, not, we're not saying that you're out of the woods yet, but if you find something else, that's great. But we're going to hold your offer just in case. And I do that. I, it's a nicer way to reject somebody. That's just Dean. That's, you, do, you can say, oh, heck no, and send it. You, know? <laughs> you could do that too. If you're Salt Lake County, they say, hell, sorry. Don't believe me. Uh, but give your offer the best chance, okay? So acknowledge the firm common ground the what and how questions, knowing that positioning is a process. But I know you guys want 850 for this twin home. And I'm going, and it's really nice. We're offering eight because nothing else justifies that price. You know, and so I know we're 50,000 apart, but we're not asking for closing costs. We're not asking for all the other stuff. And the seller counter offered at 840, no closing costs. And I said, you're not helping. You know, and so we ended up, my buyer walked and she got a great house instead. But she had to wait a couple of months. So anyway, no one to walk away. All right. Went out through the role plays. And then we're going to close here on the negotiation tips. Be professional. Again, keep your goal and your client's goals in mind. Pay attention to your communication and tone. Just because a listing agent goes, this is the dumbest offer I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, my buyers wanted me to send it to you. You know what? Use humor. I find that now, again, I know that I'm bad at humor. But or bad humor is better than no humor. And I find that it breaks some of the tension when we do it, right? And so don't get, even if your clients are crazy and they're super emotional, to say, you know what? My clients are really emotional. They really feel strongly about this. They wanted me just to try and, I'm going to use my language, talk some sense into you. I'd really like you guys to, to reconsider their offer. Their offer is a great offer. You know, we've lowered our price. Your buyers should take this offer. You know, if they can't, we understand. But this is, this is, don't ever say this is the bottom line. My seller will never come down lower unless your seller will. Because if your seller will, don't use, don't, don't bluff. And I'm going to, you can steal this one too. The best bluff is the truth. The best bluff is the truth. Don't lie. If you lie, or if you know you're not telling the truth, it'll always bite you in the tush. It will. It'll, it'll come back. It'll, oh, so now your seller is willing to negotiate. Well, market conditions have changed, or you know, whatever, but now you're having to backtrack. Say, no, my seller said they'll take it off the market. They'll lease it first. Don't, don't use that bluff unless it's real. Does that make sense? Don't, don't, my buyer said this is their, they won't come up any higher. I've had buyers literally say, you know what? I know we told you to say it. And I said, now I have to go tell them that, that you lied to me. And so I smile at my buyer and say, but I will, I want to present your offer. So, you know, my buyers had an epiphany. I didn't say they prayed on it because they didn't. They had an epiphany and they just, they really feel like this is the right house. They're willing to, you know, to come up a little bit more. Is this something your sellers can work with? Because I want to send over an, I, by the time we get into second or third addendum, I'm, I'm verbally visiting with a listing agent or a buyer's agent saying, let's just, let's figure it out. I don't want to keep sending back Addenda and addenda flying. Yes, ma'am. Is it bad thing to pay you and your client agree on a price and then you say something either higher or lower to kind of kind of trick the other person into like agreeing? Does that make sense? I don't really think any sense. No, what's I let's just Brindley, you decided that you, um you're buying my house. I want seven and a quarter. And I'm a listing side, you're the buy side, okay? I know that my sellers, I, I'll, I might take 700. Thanks for being here. I might take 700. 
you know, for the right, for the right buyer. Cause this is the neighbor. I care about my neighbors too. And so I don't want, you know, hell's angels people. And you don't seem like a hell's angels writer. Just saying, you don't seem like it. Although you could be all tatted up and you, you know, put it up under the, that, that the black helmet. And, you know, I didn't know anyway. So I'm teasing you. Bottom line is I'm not, my listing agent may not tell you that I'm coming down. I'd be willing to come to seven and a quarter. You want to, you're saying, you know what, I might be willing to do 715, you know, but let's offer 705 just for fun. And so you could have that conversation. You know what, my client is thinking of offering, you know, in the low 700s. Well, that, you know, is that a possibility to work with your client? And I'd say, all I can tell you as a listing agent, so I'm being a listing agent, said first is that my seller wants seven and a quarter and that's that's where we're at i know they'll take seven and a quarter and so i would encourage you to write your offer and write your best offer um if you wrote it at 705 i may come back and just try test the waters and say you know what why don't we meet somewhere in the middle why don't we meet it i it's not quite the middle but i want how about 715 would you do 715 after we've received your offer and you go, yeah, we, I, and you're going inside, you're going, yes, yes. You know, 715, I didn't have to pay seven and a quarter for it. And now you can, now you have a number. Yeah, I think, I think I could talk my client into that. We'll do this. Go confirm with your client that 715 will work. Once you do, I'll have my seller sign a doc and we'll send it back to you. Now we're not under contract until it's accepted. And so if we get another offer in the meantime, so if you want to send over, an addendum, that's fine too, you know, but I'll prepare a counter offer for that. So that's one way to position it because we kind of did, but yes, we could, I, we have verbals all the time. Nothing counts until it's done. In fact, even if I said, oh, my seller would take 715. I, I, I to my seller would, I think I, can get, I think I can get my seller to do 715. I'll visit with my seller about it, but I, I think we might be able to get there. Because it used to be, right, when in Crazy Town, we listed at seven and a quarter, expecting 775. I still get emails saying that my house is worth 850. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't feel that way. Anyway, great questions. Don't reveal too much. Remember when you asked, what do you think the low sevens? I say, you know what? I, I, here's my recommendation, write the, write the offer. And that's, and can I tell you guys, that's the best thing you can do. If you're a buyer agent and you sent an offer and the seller agent's yelling at you and say, you know what? I would encourage you to write the counter, counter offer it at a number that will work for your seller. If it's below list, awesome. But let me know what your seller's willing to do because I want to, and you remember my philosophy? I want to be the last guy to walk away from this table, from this negotiation table. And I've had people say, you know what? I sounds like we're at impasse and I don't know that we're going to be able to get, get more than that because my buyer really does need closing costs. The 800 on that 850 condo townhome, excuse me, probably won't work. You know, so I think we'll, you know, and in conversing with her, we've decided to walk. And so do what your client wants. But, and I love this last one here. Don't be attached to the outcome. You personally, as agents, don't be attached to the outcome. Since we're somewhere, I lost a house, I lost a sale. No, the sale's been delayed. Right? That's all. It's such a delay. We didn't get it today. Maybe, maybe tomorrow. So, moving through that. Were there any ahas at all? We talked about a bunch of stuff. Anything? It's because you haven't done a lot of it. That's all. Right? And so, do you think? Look, my, I, I have a different style. Angie has a very different style. Do you think between the two of us, just, just us two, that you might find something that may fit with your comfort zones? Yeah. Like, I wasn't aware that you would share as much as you do with the other agents. You know, it's not in writing. You know, I didn't know that you could have those conversations with the other agents as much. Yeah, no, 
I'm going to give you the, here's the, here are the broker lines. If they don't like your offer, they're going to counter offer. If you don't like their counter offer, send a counter offer back and we go back and forth. I have seen it. I have seen contracts with 18 addenda. Is there a chance you might miss an initial somewhere or a signature that we have to go back and get? Ah, you know, you know, yeah, yeah. No, I'd, I'd say I need to go back. Oh, addendum number seven, the sellers forgot to initial. Listing agent, I need you to get those initials because my broker won't pay me until they're there. You know, but because that's not my law, that's, that's state law, it's, it's a state form. It requires initials, fill out the form and do it correctly. You know, and so, sorry. So what I do though, this is why I like to review all my docs prior to settlement. Sellers, one of the sellers going to sign their docs, one of the buyers going to sign their docs. Hey, here's a copy of the REPSI. Would you please have them initial this page of the REPSI or sign this page? They initialed it. They just didn't sign it. They even checked the accept box, but they didn't sign it for some reason. I, I need a signature. I know they initialed it and checked that. You know, so I'm a nut. But so the, the actual line is everything's an addendum back and forth. In reality, we negotiate a lot of times just by having a conversation. Let's find something that everyone can live with so that we, I like to write an addendum, a counter offer addendum that the other party's willing to accept. Sometimes even as a listing agent, I'll get an offer and I'll say, you know what? We would love to counter offer you with something that, let's say there's only one offer. We'd like to counter offer you with something that my sellers will accept, your buyer will accept. Can we have this conversation? We'll go back to your buyer and have this conversation. This is kind of what we want. Are there, I mean, but I'm talking about the price. I'm also talking about certain terms. My seller needs time to move out because they're building a place. So there's a moving target. So let's set a settlement deadline either before or after so they get their money and we can do a seller lease back. Or, you know, but I want to, want to have that conversation with you because I put it in the listing, but you didn't address it. And so I have to have that conversation with you. Or does the buyer have to move now because they're getting out of their apartment at the end of the month and that's a week from tomorrow, right? So those things are important to, to negotiate. I can have one. Mm. Uh, I think it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fun. This is the fun if part. Nice. Well, if they're not, if they're not nice. Oh my goodness, you've, you've, you've always heard all right, public speaking. Who loves public speaking? Who loves to do it? Not a whole bunch in here. I didn't see a lot of hands. It's okay. You, you, what you're saying, Brenda, doesn't kill you, right? Public speaking doesn't kill you. Okay. Yeah. Hasn't yet. I've, I've, I've tried several times to, but what I, right. So what was one of the bad things they tell you? Pretend everybody's in their underwear. Guess what? Everybody is, you know, all right. But one says, don't do that because that's distracting. But what I do sometimes is if someone's naggy on the other end in a negotiation, cartoon their voice. You know, well, uh, I don't know. You know, and you start having, you start, what I'm saying is if you cartoon it almost, pretend that he or she's speaking in a cartoon voice instead of a snippy voice. <laughs> well, I don't know. You have an iPhone. I don't. So I'm not smart enough to use an iPhone. So it, there might be. You know, but you can cartoon someone's face or something like that, right? But cartoon it. All I'm saying is you can have fun with it. Life is too short not to have fun. This, is a, this career path is something I absolutely love. It's not about houses. It's about the people. And it's about cooperating. I love a business that's very cooperative. Um, because we, we will fight like titans even for the same listings. Something just to let you know. If I went and did a listing appointment, they said, yeah, I've got an appointment with Scarlett after me, after you, Dean. I'm going to say, you know what? You should list with Scarlett. Because I will not, even though I'm a competing broker, I won't compete against my agents. I just don't. I had one of my sellers called me and he said, it was when I told you about the lady, the $850,000 townhome, she ended up buying a $650,000 brand new house. You know, and it was awesome. And she had more square footage and it was a better house for her. Anyway, <clears throat> they were a referral from this client. I had sold them their million dollar house. Then they went and put $100,000 into their home, re, you know, doing a facelift on their house so they could sell it. And they said, Dean is down to two agents. It's you and you and Sue Ann. And you'll meet Sue Ann and she's wonderful. I said, no, you list with Sue Ann. 
They said, really? I said, Dean, if you sell us to list with you, we'll do it. And I said, look, I don't compete against my agents. Sue Ann is an amazing agent, and she does it all the time. I don't do as much. I think you'll be better with Sue Ann. And I just did it. And it, it was it seven seven $700,000. So it was um, probably about an $18,000 commission-ish because it wasn't a 3%. It was a 2.5%. I just, I, I just knew that. It wasn't about the money, but it was about my clients. And I thought they would get a better deal working with Sue Ann. But that's a win-win, don't you think? Sue Ann loves me still. Unless she, when she, except when she doesn't. And that's, I'm teasing. She, she's awesome. Um, there have been some times when I, when I messed up and she will call me to the carpet and let me know, you messed up. But I love knowing where I stand. But more importantly, she gave me some information about my client that they didn't tell me. They said, oh, Cheryl has breast cancer. She's you know, really struggling with her health. You know, and they just bought this new million dollar house and they just put $400,000 into it, remodeling it. See, they remodeled it before they remodeled their current home that was of the $700,000 house. So anyway, I was able to get a hold of them, find out how she's doing and you know, visit and just be engaged with them. She's doing great. Her hair looks like mine. It's real spiky and hers is more spiky and fashionable and colored. But um, mine's colored, but it's natural. Um, <clears throat> but they introduced me to their daughter. They have a son who's going through his residency. When he comes back, they'll introduce me to him. And I still have more deals that we'll be doing. We're now looking at investment properties for them. So I didn't lose the client. I, I gained their trust. They said, you will always be our realtor. But thank you for introducing us to Swan to help us sell our house on that. I'm sorry. We nope, that was it. Okay. So I'm gonna do this. Just, I apologize. Ritz, we're gonna call it a call it a wrap. And thank you all for being online. Thanks, Dean. All right, see ya.